Thank you for joining us for Three Bs on the Law podcast, hosted by Trisha Barita, Camille Canali, and Susan Dawson. Disclaimer, this podcast is for entertainment and informational purposes only, not meant to provide legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. Also remember, laws change or they differ by jurisdiction. So this is not a substitute for seeking legal counsel in your jurisdiction on the current law applicable to you. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Three Bs on the Law. I am very excited to introduce you to our guest today. I have known Elizabeth Colon. I've been fortunate to have known her for years and have, have used her translation services in my business. So we have Elizabeth here from, oh my goodness, I've already, I'm already going to mispronounce it. Miss, I forgot it already. Elizabeth, help me out. I'll jump in and introduce my company. Okay, you tell me. Everyone. You tell everyone. Thank you for the invite, you too, Camille. My name is Elizabeth, and I am the president of Metaphrasis Language and Culture Solutions, an interpreting and translation company located in Chicago, but we do serve national clients. What we do is we provide access to high-quality interpreters and document translations to businesses and organizations that want to connect to their employees or their clients in a language that they speak, and that way they eliminate the language barriers. So why is it important for employers to communicate with their team? It's very important. So think about it this way. You know, we talk about being inclusive, right? If you have employees that do not speak English, for example, you're excluding those employees from what everyone else is receiving within the organization, within the company. If you're a company hiring somebody in the manufacturing world, you're working with a lot of equipment. If that employee doesn't understand how to use those equipments, you're going to have some workman compensation cases <laughs> following immediately after if they, you know, tear or break a finger or kind of go into have an injury. But furthermore, you want them to be feeling part of the team. And so when you assume that they possibly understand the confirmation that you're conveying to everyone else and they're being left out, they tend to have low morale within the organization. You don't care about them, right? They're, that's at least what they're thinking. You don't care about them. And it's just the right thing to do. If you're going to hire bilingual individuals within your company, make sure that if they're not proficient in the language that you're speaking, at least have the materials in a language that they can speak. And that way they're comfortable making the decisions that it's right for them when it comes to choosing their health benefits, right? Clocking in and clocking out understanding how much vacation time they have, if they have profit sharing, like how they can contribute, how much they can contribute. And, you know, those are very small details that for us, we understand it, but for them, they may not get it. Well, quite frankly, there's a lot of English speaking employees out there that can't understand it either. But, but I, yeah, right. <laughs> That's true. But, exactly. <laughs> but I love the, the focus on inclusivity, you know, as, as lawyers, Kamel and I, focus so much on making sure employees, you know, understand the legal ramifications of not following the policy, right? Mm -hmm. But but I love that your message is more about that cultural awareness that, and I mean cultural in a company culture, not necessarily outside of that, but that these are, especially today, or when employees are hard to find, good employees are hard to keep too, um, to really embrace that concept of, inclusivity in your workplace, making people feel a part and in, of, of the culture, even if they don't, if language, if English isn't their first language. Mm -hmm. I, I love that message. It's so important. Uh, but we do focus on, on legal documents here. So talk to us about uh, employee policies. And when you're putting legal documents in place, why is it so important to have a translator as opposed to you know, that that um, that general manager that also, you know, took three years of, of Spanish in college and thinks he can just translate it. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So think about a human resource policy. There are 25, 30 pages. Right. Sometimes even more. There's a lot of, of technical and legal information in there. And when you have an employee that's trying to go through those papers, or those pages rather, and they don't understand any of it, they're going to immediately sign something 
without actually knowing what they're signing. And that really is a liability that falls back on the company because there's always going to be a miscommunication and there's always going to be misunderstanding of what their role is. Or again, falling back to like the benefits that they're entitled to understanding, you know, how to ask for time off. So when you bring in an employee, which we see this all the time, even someone who's grown up in a home speaking Spanish, right? They may have learned conversational Spanish, Polish with their families at home, but put them into a situation where they have to translate information and it's not their terminology. It's not going to work. It's, you know, there's going to be omissions in the information. So now take the college example. You said somebody who took college Spanish for three years and come on in and, and translate this for this. They're not, they're not going to know what they're doing. Honestly, you know, they're going to skim through it and they're going to interpret what they want to interpret that's on that paper. And so you're not providing that employee fairness because it comes down to being fair. Right. So then you said it, you know, even we that speak English. Right. Sometimes we don't understand our benefits. So imagine the employee that maybe limited English profession knows some English, but not enough to get by. And then we cheat them out of the opportunity to better understand our culture within the organization, right? How to cho um, rightfully choose our benefits or the steps that we need to take if we want to file a grievance. And they don't know how to do it because this 35 page human resource policy was explained in two short sentences, right? Think about it. Is that fair to, to anyone in that matter? It's not. And so it's important that when we identify even someone within our organization that we feel can translate, we should also make sure that if that's the person that you're going to use moving forward, at least get that person tested for their proficiency. Find out the level of proficiency that person has. And if they score high, then great, use them all the time. But if they score low, meaning basic conversation, that's the last person you want to use. Right. And so that kind of goes to if you have an employee that's fluent in the language and they even explain the policy as opposed to translating it on paper. Yes. Um, what I assume the same issues arise or similar issues at least arise with that. There is. And it, it's two different <laughs> skill sets. And, right. you know, it took me a long time to learn this myself. But, you know, interpreters, we render the message orally. Right. You and I will have the conversation. But when you get into the written form of it, that's a huge liability because you write something down in another language and it's incorrect. Imagine the liability for an organization that does that. I mean, I grew up speaking Spanish. That's my first language. I was an interpreter, you know, many moons ago. But there were areas in which I did interpreting and, and I had to translate. I didn't know the vocabulary. Or, you know, and so I had to write those things down because I was trained as a professional interpreter. So I had to write them down, go back and learn it for for when I went back and did interpreting for somebody else in a similar position. I knew the vocabulary, but not everyone's going to think that way. So I always encourage if you're not a highly skilled translator, do not put yourself in a position to offer any of your writing translations to anyone unless you want to get in trouble because <laughs> that's right you know and one of the interesting things that i learned through unfortunately trial and error is mm -hmm. that various languages have different dialects yes and it actually the interpretation could be different depending upon the dialect and so that's one of the things i unfortunately learned the hard way at a deposition that my interpreter wasn't speaking with my witness yeah. because I came from different parts of the country and they spoke a different dialect. Um, and so I think that that can make a big difference um, as well. If you have, especially if you have a general employee mm -hmm. doing the translating. Right. And, and that often happens. And I'll use a Spanish, for example, because the dialects in Spanish, are, they vary. And I, I myself have been in that same position of picking up on cues and I'm translating something. I'm like, this really doesn't sound right. Right. But I was trained to recognize that. And then I can easily go back and, and verify and clarify. But if you're not skilled to do that, that you have that example, like you just shared right now, Camille, of, you know, there's a disconnect. Right. And those disconnects can create actually more problems in the long run because you're trying to get to particular answers and their way of framing it is different from what you're expecting to hear. Right.
Yeah, you know, the other issue from a legal perspective is let's say that we want to terminate an employee for not following the policy and they're able to point out that the translation was wrong yes. and they couldn't understand it because it wasn't translated correctly, right? Mm -hmm. Where does that put the employer? They put all this effort and time and thought. I mean, the reason we put policies together, yes, we put it together so employees understand what they need to do and what their rights are and all of that. But the bottom line, most businesses put it together to protect themselves yes. so that employees understand what they, what they have to do or, you know, what their options are. So, you know, in today's day, today's internet day, right? Everyone wants to do everything cheaper on the internet. We've got mm -hmm. things like Google Translate where you can put whole paragraphs and documents right through that process. But I've got to believe that similar to what you're saying, it's not specific enough if you want this document to hold up in a court. What do you, how do you feel about, uh, about, about those kinds of services? I put it this way. Uh, Google Translate is not a human being, right? And it's, it's artificial intelligence and that's great and wonderful and it's going to keep on advancing and technology is going to come and it's going to improve it, but it's not human. And that's the part that's missing. And you're never going to be able to create that. So putting in a paragraph or pages into Google Translate is a huge, huge liability. I promise you, you will find errors in that. And employers and organizations, I hear this very time and time again, it's expensive. Maybe, right? Maybe initially it's expensive, but it's been translated properly. You're going to keep it for years to come. If you have a change that you have to make in a certain paragraph, it's going to cost you a minimal, you know, dollars. And it's not going to be a whole much, a lot of money to change that, but put it into Google translate and get the whole thing translated. And it's a lot of mistakes in there. What is that going to happen to an employer? Right. What's the cost of the translation versus the cost of litigation? Exactly. Well, right. you know, and the, the other thing is the employer is not going to recognize likely the mistakes that are made in the translation because right. obviously they don't speak the language, which is why they're using a translation yes. service to begin with. Yes, correct. And, then, and let me say that using Google Translate for a word or two here and there is perfectly fine because I use it sometimes when I want to verify a particular word or maybe just one sentence. But I've also played with it and, and inserted a whole paragraph just to see what I get back. And it's really off the chart. It's not correct. You know, and if you do research and studies, you will find that there's a high error rate on doing Google Translate or any other platform that does translations. And they're working on it. I'm not going to take away and give them, you know, not give them credit for it. But I just strongly feel that it's not the human person. It's not the human person that's going to sit there for you take their time to translate everything, go back and search certain words that they may say, hmm, they may be a conflict, they want to make sure it's correct, or even speak your 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 client's registry, your employers, your employees, do they read at a third grade level? Do they read at a, read at a sixth grade level? They take that into consideration. And then having that document completed and then giving it to an editor to proofread it, right? To make sure that it is accurate. So there's a process that goes into translating documents. Google translation is not doing that for you. <laughs> no, you know, it's just you're dumping it in there and you're going to get what you get. And that's it. You know, and we have to be really careful with that. So when someone needs the translation company, what types of things should they look for? Like, are there special certifications or expertise that business owners should look for when they want to have things like their handbook or termination documents or contract yes. reviewed. Yes. Yeah. You know, translation companies are sole entrepreneurs to companies that have multiple um, language language pairs. One thing that's very important to, for me, if I was searching for a translation company is the certification. It doesn't, not everyone has the national certification required and not everyone's gonna require it of the people that they work with. So you have to really ask that question specifically. Are your translators certified? And if not, what criteria do you measure for them to be qualified, right? To be doing translation services for you. I require certification. I require a bachelor's degree or higher. I require that my translators 
are um, specializing in that industry. I would not give a, trans a legal translation to someone who specializes in healthcare, right? Um, I would get references. And if it's a sole entrepreneur who offers their translation services, I would dig a little bit deeper and start interviewing them as if I were going to hire them as my employee, because you want to make sure that they have the right credentials behind them to support the work that they're doing and that they're delivering to you. Yeah, right. And I know, oh, sorry, Susan, I was going to say, I know for my purposes, I always use a certified translator because okay. it can come by, you know, in the legal world, at least things can yes. come back to bite you in the high knee. <laughs> we want to, we want to avoid that. So for depositions and legal, um, formal legal documentation, we want to avoid that. You know, there are some instances where I will have someone informally translate, but there are very few um, mm -hmm. and far between. Great. Yeah. And that's what we should all be doing. It's, it's, it's important. It's yeah. important. I, I think, um, the message is yes, upfront. If you're if you're giving me a 30 page or a 40 page or 50 page document, yes, the upfront cost, there's a cost to that. But just like you said, once I have it, now amendments are not going to be as expensive. Right. And I am I have this certification to hand you so that when you end up in court, you can say, look what I did. I used a professional translation, certified translation company. You know, we did everything we could on our end mm -hmm. to make sure that this was communicated appropriately. And you can use that as a defense in your litigation if you if you end up there. And as lawyers, Camille and I are very, very aware of how expensive a lawsuit can be compared to the upfront cost of getting it translated correctly. That is so true. And the companies you know, those who are, who stand by their work, right, will give you a certificate of translation and it, they'll have it notarized in advance for you too, because they trust that the translation team has done the, the job for you. So yes, we don't, we don't look at the hidden costs <laughs> we, until they hit you in the face and then you're like, yes, I should have got that translator, right? Right. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us today. It's always for me a pleasure to get to see you. Yeah. Um, and I'm so glad to get to introduce you to our, our podcast audience. And um, I just want to, thanks for taking the time to be here today and I'd say goodbye to our audience, to them, uh, to say thank you to everyone for joining us again on Three Bs on the Law. Thank you for joining us on today's podcast of Three Bs on the Law. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our podcast. We also welcome any comments. If you'd like to get in touch with us or suggest a future topic, you can email us at 3, T-H-R-E-E, B's on the law at gmail.com. And because we're lawyers, we need to remind you that this podcast is not meant to provide you with legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.